Did you already do a mic check? Lake Effect Poetry is live on the air. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, so we are actually doing a fundraiser all day today, and that's why Vertigo's been here setting all this up and why there's a microphone in the middle of the coffee shop on a Sunday. Um, we're going to be doing poetry until midnight because we're hardcore like that. <laughs> And it's uh, all part of a fundraiser for the Lake Effect Poetry Team. We are your Northeast Ohio slam team. Um, and we will be competing in August at the National Slam Competition in North Carolina. So um, all good poetry teams have to raise money because poets are broke. So. Um, We'll be reading poetry. Uh, other people will be coming up and performing at various points uh, through the evening, uh, afternoon and evening. And what we'd like to do is encourage you to, even if you're here just to relax and you really don't care about poetry, after you hear silence on the mic, just kind of clap for a second, you know, or, or snap a little bit and, and then go back to what you're doing. It makes everybody feel loved. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you'd like some time on the mic, uh, because it is a fundraiser, that's kind of a, a weird situation where everybody that's performing is actually paying for their time on the mic, so it's a dollar a minute um, to be up here and, and supporting us. If you uh, aren't into the performing aspect, but you'd still like to support us, you can go to, is it, it's lakeeffectpoetry.com, right, Vertigo? Lakeeffectpoetry.com, and you can make a donation. Uh, you can also just put a little bit of money in the tip jar and, and we'll love you forever. So it's easy like that. Also, the poetry today, the performances today are unmoderated. So I don't see any youngins here right now. That should, shouldn't be a problem, but just be aware that there, there might be sensitive topics or um, language that you wouldn't normally use in public, things like that. Um, but uh, my name is Carla Thompson and I'm going to read a few of my own pieces to get us started. And then I'll read a couple by people that I really like before I turn over the mic. So what people figure out early on is um, I'm a mom and I'm a teacher and most of my poems seem to either talk about being a mom or a teacher. And this is one that I wrote um, a little bit before I left my last high school and a few months after my last student got shot, what they tell you when you teach in public schools is that you should expect for at least one student a year to die. And I think I'm pretty sure that that's what I averaged. So you stay sane by uh, talking about it. So this one's called Let's Talk. I wonder why we don't talk anymore, at work or after, sit on porches, out in the backyard, or have the real conversations about what's behind all the obvious in-your-face stuff. Do we discuss more than the surface even with the people we call friends? I think we are worried about what they will say. They may call us radical if we compare a president to Hitler or scream about murdering feminists if I tell her to consider abortion or admit that I've had one or even just contemplate that it might be okay? Will they call us racist if we say distinctly, firmly, that right now our black children need help like no other? So the things we won't speak on out of fear, politeness, or ignorance are slowly killing us all. And the inside death that comes from a heart choked on words unspoken is particularly painful, even if silent. At work, we don't speak on things anymore. Afraid that it's like a bad TV show or movie they've already seen. I mean, Lean On Me is such a played out song. So it's not so moving to mention that her daddy is in jail and his mama is on crack and her brother is dead and he's out on the block all night and she has a baby and another on the way and he's on his third foster home and she's so good we forget to teach her and he's so quiet we forgot he's in the room and all the grown folks are overworked and none of these kids seem to care and we're all so damn broke. And sometimes I just get so, so tired. At those times, facing my students, 
I hear my father saying, baby, you can't save them all, but I don't know how to stop trying. Even after they shot Cortez, some more are still smoking blunts behind the corner store, and the boys are shooting dice in the bathroom, and someone's weave is laying on the hall floor. Sometimes, out of desperation, I pray to God, the goddess, to the universe, hell, whoever will answer me first. And if I am still and willing to listen, will the answer come? I can't save the world, but I can change it with these. With my two hands, they're all I need to clean up the trash on the street, to write a letter, letter to the politician of the moment, to teach the room, to hold up a child higher than they may have seen before. We can change it by opening our mouths, having those real conversations about all these obvious things. Rejoice about the little things that made us smile. What did you accomplish today? Tell each other what we did well. Discuss what we are missing, why some things are just wrong. Admit that we still miss family and friends long after they're gone. I get so angry at the opportunities for healing we let slide by in the name of moving on. Sometimes, in my mind, I find Cortez in the hall. And right before I yell at him to get to class, I speak to him. I get real close. Baby, we didn't forget you. Baby, your friends are still learning. And we are really talking to each other now. I show him my hands. Baby, we know there has to be another way. Thank you. The other important thing is to buy lots of coffee. Thank you to the new Coffee Fix for sponsoring us today. Yay, <laughs> Yay caffeine. Huh? <laughs> Legal narcotics, yay. Um, this year was the first time I actually tried to get something published, and the Hessler Street Anthology took one of my pieces. So that was wonderful. And this one is called Little Brother Beauty Is. My first thought was to backhand you hard across the face until you came back since obviously it wasn't you now sitting calmly at my table. I don't think there is anything wrong with me. I am just open to the Lord, as if the pastor that assumed you needed fixed was the open-minded one, the true voice of God. She supposedly is successful at helping young men like you, those who happen to see the beauty and the sinew and sharp edges of other men. And maybe I should have smacked you. Clapped hard enough to momentarily stun the snake I saw approaching. Opposing imposture of you, hissing, insidi insidious whispers sliding into other young ears. Venomous fangs dripping the Savior's blood, telling people in their most vulnerable years how terribly wrong they are. That the posters lie. God does indeed make junk, and they are of the worst kind. I want to hug whatever parts of you need healing the most, but maybe I should just ask you to leave my house. I am as yet unsure if self-loathing is contagious and children who still know they are perfect and thought you were too live here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jerry. Are you having a good day? I'm not interrupting your newspaper reading too much, Emma. All right. Um, I'd like to read you a few pieces from the 2012 Team Anthology, which is for sale over there with Vertigo. And it's $6 that also, what? Uh, on the website? Oh, so they can get it at LakeEffectPoetry.com too? Beautiful. See, I'm learning how to promote. I can do this. So you can either buy it here or online. And for $6, you get the poetry of all four five people that were part of the Like Effect Poetry team. Um, uh, 
And even though I'm going to read you my pieces that are in here now, you should still try and buy it. This is called Thicker Than Water. If it was up to my dad, he would have never told me, worrying that the telling would have somehow changed things. But one day after school, my mom sat me down on the couch across from her, pulled my little brother into her lap, and without too much fanfare, told us the truth. And I had laughed at the absurdity of it all before I realized she was serious. Now, I had volunteered to be the one to tell my father that I finally knew everything. That years ago, after they had lost their first daughter to frail lungs, before they were surprised with the conception of their son, they had adopted me. So I was 12 when I sat my dad down and told him that it was all right, that I knew, that it didn't matter because we had the same eyebrows anyways, and he had taught me how to tie my shoes and whipped me for lying to my mom, and there was never enough money, but there was all this extra love, and he was still my dad, right? That's it. <laughs> That's one of my Big Al poems. I miss my daddy. But Big Al was awesome. Okay. I um, shared this anthology with a friend of mine. And he told me that he really liked the poetry in it, but he was almost uncomfortable, uncomfortable because we were friends and he felt like he was being a voyeur into my life because my poems were so uh, personal. And I think it's one of those where you write it down and you hope you make it artistic enough that people love you even though you're a little uh, effed up. So. That being said, love me anyways. And this one is called Denise at Five. When she was five and I was six, we were two little yellow girls in the same class. Denise had a cute little afro and my mom, terrified of using the same relaxers on me that she wrestled with herself, mercilessly brushed my hair each morning, clipping it back tight with red plastic ribbon barrettes into a semblance of straightness. It was almost there, but not. We would hug each other and clap. Miss Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, 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 with silver buttons, 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 all down here, and fall into the grass laughing, playing with our same but different hair. I loved her then, but called it best friends for lack of understanding. Me, not knowing why I hated Rhonda when she walked with her, or why I punched the boy who was there one day when I came to play. I was a first grader, pink dresses, long hair, a semblance of straightness, almost there, but not. You make me happy. <laughs> The weird thing is, is like, I hadn't, uh, I, that, that poem is actually about a real event, and I hadn't seen Denise until a couple years ago, so, you know, 30 or so years go by, and the first thing you say to somebody is, oh, hey, I remember you, I wrote a poem about you, and I totally can't show it to you, because it'll make me sound like a stalker freak, so. <laughs> I didn't tell her that part, I just said, you know, hey, haven't seen you in a while. But. Uh, this one is called Virgin. I held her close. She had practiced, learned, and she was good. Great even, but still unprepared. She had not planned well enough for this, so we hid together, away from younger prying eyes, embracing between the soiled stall and marble sink because she did not want them to see, could not let them know that it was her first time. Messengers had come around earlier in the day to tell us what the kids already knew, that he was gone. 
One of them, the same one who had knocked on my class windows yesterday while playing in the hall, was gone, shot execution style while friends watched. Over, one to the leg. Four, another in the back. What, she asked me. A third rolled in his skull, and she had waited until the first bell to run across the hall and throw up where her students couldn't see. So I held her close while we both cried. You see, it was her first time, and I knew he would not be her last. And, and I swear teaching in public high school isn't always depressing, but that's what you end up writing about, right? Okay, the last one of my pieces I'm gonna read right now is called Birth Controlled. And I'm happy because my, my husband actually came up with that title and I like it. In the classroom, I tell them they can't write about it. Too controversial, I say. The logic becomes fallacy written, no matter the position. I tell them, write about something more challenging. I don't mention that I've had one or more than one. It's none of their business, really. But when my son asks about it, the one who is so unwilling to do harm, I often compare him to Snow White, I can tell what he wants me to say, that he is right and it is so wrong. But I consciously decided to make him. I purposely loved him and his brother into existence. I set my body about the business of being God and the results were good. So I am uncomfortable with anyone believing it is his right to remove my divinity. You guys are doing a sort of good job of clapping random noises. All right, that's cool. Okay. Before I step away for a minute and turn the mic over to another teammate, um, I'm going to read a poem out of the Brant 21 anthology. A group of writers that get together at the Brant 21 gallery. They're awesome. And this poem was written by Dan Smith. For all of you that are watching online, I wanted to pick a Cleveland poem. I like this. And it's called Cleveland Always With Us. Cleveland, what are you waiting for? The second coming of Tom Johnson? Wobblies marching into the man, into man the soapboxes and reap your harvest of words? Cleveland, faceless in the night, wrapped in neon brilliance, ripping and running always with us. The ghosts of Indian tribes and my unborn twin in lines of dark prophecy choked from our veins and trinkets wrapped in blankets of disease. The gray mass of your towers bleeding the transit of days from our minds, sunless in canyons of inarticulate desire. Surrounded by ghosts made speechless, by blind acceptance and horrified by our addictions to lies, we wander aimless. In the zombie malls of empty hunger is always of empty hungers always, always with us, the mad singing of poets calling us to gather our wits. Join the sanity humanity chorus and climb up from the catacombs, up out of dank minds of crystalline deception, backlit in the blue cathcode glow of merciless commerce, smiley faced and heartless cutting a collage from mummifying hearts, slowly turning green with envy for the dead. Cleveland always with us, and when the sun shines, it's a hydrogen bomb and the lake turns to glass and we put on diamond skates and do figure eights while the dealers shake the aces from their sleeves. And we sing old Dylan songs till they dim the lights, but we never sleep and my twin has no memory of me, but only I of him. It's my mythology. And he takes my hand and asks me if I'm real. And I lie again, tell him don't the buildings look fine as the loop spools through the night. Attention, Walmart shoppers. <laughs> Yay, Dan Smith. Me like you. Corey, you ready? Got a, got a few for him? OK. Uh, I'm going to get a refill of caffeine that I really don't need. And one of my teammates, Corey Mikesell, is going to come to the mic and read for a little bit. All right. Thank you.
Have you ever fallen in love with the house? Licked your lips at the sight of her cantilevered hips? I mean, really gotten a hard on for her rich mahogany hardwoods or been weak in the knees for the ambition of her chimney, piercing the sky like the heretical Tower of Babel, erecting a middle finger to God, my childhood house was a mansion but not in the redundance of her elegance or expanse, but in the grandeur of her radiance. Her carpets were warm like a lover's skin at the exact moment when you begin to confuse who is who and where you end and their soul begins. Her shutters were sleep-trimmed eyes, drunk on contentment and heavy sighs, unconcerned with the icy reprisals of winter to come. And upon that inevitable snowfall, my house would swaddle me in its arms and hum tropical love songs until I floated off to a land of equatorial dreams and streams that float on into infinity. Well, that was 10 years ago to this day, and the wrecking crews have since had their say, and the cement ribbon I used to ascend, its bending serpentine neck extending up the precipitous hillside to my castle in the sky, now only leads to the inexorable march of progress. And though I'm still young, I can hear myself pleading to her in the hushed tones the elderly use when whispering secrets to their loved ones as they diffuse like diaphanous apparitions in the rising sun. And upon that inevitable sunrise, I was left alone with the question of whether I had truly loved my house, or rather the moments couched in the strat of my youth where truth lay bare back on the roof and watched the autumn stars as they spun, cascading through the tapestry of the zodiac until winter had once again come. So I shut my eyes when I passed by and think of a time when a hole in the ground wasn't enough to make me cry. And though I never had the strength to attend the funeral for my oldest friend, if there comes a day when I can give a eulogy at long delay, I think this is what I would say. Well, I don't live here anymore. On the shore where more hollow endings wait to greet the sea, like the sand castles inside me wait for your lunar gravity. And I haven't been here for a while, so excuse me if I stumble in the darkness of your halls, because my fingers can no longer read the braille on your crumbling walls. But I want to be inside you when your last ceiling falls, because you're inside me where my heart should be. You feel like high school ten years on and the lawn I used to dream on is covered with the landmines of passing time and the chorus lines in my head have all danced away. And even the nostalgia of this moment won't make them stay. The past is always slipping farther out of reach and out of touch, but I'll reach for it anyway. All right, so I'm going to do one that I literally just wrote. So if it's absolutely terrible, fresh e typing, yes, on a computer. Today was a bad day. Just like any day when I stumble on your picture in the attic of my brain. It was the kind of day where you fight the chill of a gray November with sweaters and dryer warm flannel sheets, but never quite seem to overcome the creeping sting of winter. Insulation. I have no insulation from the intruding breeze when you breathe and unfold your memory on me. So I rebuilt my, my home at the bottom of the sea, far away from the tepid tide and wax and wane of your emotional availability. But I miss you. I've fallen asleep so many times listening to the sound of your breath on the other end of the telephone line that sometimes I call no one because static reminds me of you. I miss you like the greatest lie I've ever told. No, Mrs. Riley, I don't have pneumonia. And I'm not really a member of the Church of Christ the Scientist. And I didn't really spend the last two weeks trying to heal myself through the power of prayer. I just really hate the shit out of your class. I miss you like Republicans miss the 18th century. I miss you like Rick Santorum misses his dignity, secretly and in the company of strange men. I miss you like Wilson! I miss you like a priest misses those drunk text messages from Jesus. OMG, so drunk right now, totally appearing on toast tomorrow. I miss you like the heart attack I've never had, reminding me that life is a fight and the day you stop trying is the day you start dying. I miss you like Jerry Sandusky misses not getting indicted. I miss you like the final star on Mario. You complete me. I miss you like the last three pages of The Return of the King. That is to say, I miss you like Frodo Baggins misses Samwise Gamgee. I miss you like Tom Cruise misses his sanity. 
this is the first poem I've ever written that's more about love and less about vanity. It's the first one I've ever written that's more, more about you and less about me. I miss you like not knowing any better. I miss you like Minnesota back roads, an empty gas tank and one billion stars humming me to sleep. I miss you like scars because there's nothing as sexy as a flaw in a masterpiece. I miss you like the first time I saw the ocean alone. I miss you. Sometimes I just take off running because once you told me that every cool breeze was a kiss from you to me. I want to be swirled in a sea of it, learn to breathe in it because it's half past nine and way past the time I should have started my life underwater. But please, I don't ever want to see you again because I miss you and I don't want that to change. Okay, this was an angry one for these, this religious hate group that shows up on my campus every year to be very mean to people. What I hear when the hate-mongering religious zealots show up on my campus to preach each year. When you proclaim to know the ultimate truth of the universe, what I actually hear you say is, I like to yell about things I don't understand screamed the blowhorn attached to half a man so squeaky clean that even when he dreams he must have that arm and hammer soapbox sheen. When you hold up your sign saying God hates fags, I hear you whisper that once when you were 15 you caught a glimpse of your best friend undressing through the slightly ajar bedroom door and lingered there just a moment longer than any God-fearing heterosexual should have. When you called that little girl who clung tightly to her physics textbook a terrorist because she wore a burqa, I hear the disclaimer, warning, if Jesus were here today, he'd slap me across the face for the things I'm about to say in his name, about gays and Jews and spicks and kikes and all the people not my preferred shade of pearly white. And when you declare that any woman who uses birth control to be a whore, I imagine the sky broke open and it rained condoms for 40 days and 40 nights and, and a voice that sounded like Samuel L. Jackson came booming from the heavens and exclaimed, shit, son, you really need to get laid. As many of my friends know, I do not believe. Compassion is the only God I can see. I'm here today to say that spewing, that being the loudest does not make you the consensus. I'm here to say that spewing your hate publicly does not justify your vitriolic ideology. It took me 20 years to realize that certainty is not a virtue to me. So I started my own church, one where doubt is our philosophy. We are filled with doubt because doubt is honest and doubt is real and doubt doesn't fly planes into buildings with unrelenting zeal. We refuse to believe that fear has anything to do with love and we have no idea whether this is ordained from above. That's why our gospel is one line long and says, hold someone you care for close tonight because tomorrow might never come. And we have no interest in being soapbox clean because our spots and our smudges are what make us one of a kind masterpieces. At my church, everyone's allowed to preach, but no one opens their mouths. We let our footprints be our speech. We worship every Italian grandmother who's ever prepared a meal for 25. We worship every firefighter who hasn't made it out alive. We worship every father who's ever picked up an extra shift to give his daughter braces and a boost in self-confidence. We worship every friend who's ever stayed on the phone till 3 a.m., listened to someone cry and never mentioned it again. Most of all, we worship anyone who's ever dared to love without the approval of aunts, uncles, fathers, mothers, sisters, teachers, society, the government, or all of the above. No, our gods don't walk on water, and some can't even swim. But they've all taught me more about love than this man's hateful philosophy ever did.
Okay, I guess I get to fill some time here. I am Vertigo Xavier. I am the manager of the Lake Effect team, which means I'm the guy pretending I know what I'm doing. True story, there's a standoff in the kitchen. The human is fixing sesame teriyaki noodles and meatballs. To his right, the dog, meatball, I smell meatball. Give me meatball, I smell meatball. To his left, the cat, I do not care what you are making, but you will be giving it to me. I'm waiting. If you do not give me what you are making, I will be forced to use my claws. The human reaches for the minced onion. The cat headbutts him in the kneecap and digs a claw into his ankle. The dog smells meatball and takes a step forward. The cat jumps off the human's foot and claws the dog's face. Both creatures land in their original positions. The standoff resumes. Cat, you aren't planning on eating that, are you? It will be mine. Dog, meatball, meatball, meatball. The human removes the meatballs from the microwave and starts to drop them into the noodles. Meatball! The dog tries to knock the human over, so the last meatball falls to the floor. The cat moves faster and knocks the falling beef sphere under the baby gate that keeps the dog out of the basement. The cat is certain to twitch her tail in the dog's face as she crawls under the gate to claim her prize. Taking note, the human removes two slices of American cheese from the refrigerator. As he opens the wrappers, the cat runs back into the kitchen, her meatball forgotten. Cheese is mine! Cheese is mine! Turns out the dog likes cheese too and is delighted to wolf down two slices, sharing none with the cat. The human then transfers the noodles from the saucepan into a bowl, takes a pair of chopsticks from the drawer, and retires with his lunch to the computer room. Lost my connection, not completely out of touch with the world at large. Haiku. I once had a dream that I had a dream. But it was just a dream, I think. And I couldn't remember what the dream was, but can you have a dream within a dream so you can dream about a dream? And I once knew a guy who had a dream, but the dream died and he was dead. And nobody ever saw him again, so nobody knew what the dream was. Maybe not him. But I dream I can dream, and my dreams don't make sense. But I can't dream unless I'm asleep, and my dreams won't let me sleep. But a dream told me I couldn't dream asleep, so I have to dream awake. But you can't dream awake, I think. Learn everything there is to know about IT work in 10 seconds or less. Lesson one, keep trying shit until something works. Congratulations, you now know everything you need to know to be a Microsoft Certified Help Desk Technician. Ladies and gentlemen, we are trying to get the money to get our National Poetry Slam team to National Poetry Slam. Um, we have eight days until we have to leave, and we don't have we don't yeah we don't have gas money to get there. So. 
We have a tip jar here, please, please. If you would like to buy performance time, poetry, short story, music, any kind of performance, um, you know, ten dollars will get you ten minutes at the mic. Uh, you know, thirty bucks will get you a whole half hour. If you want to do a ninety-minute set, hey, w w talk to me. We'll do it. <laughs> we will be here till midnight, folks at home. Um, we can stream in. Yeah, you can do a remote reading via Skype or Google Plus. Um, just give me a call. My number should be scrolling. On, somewhere in, the, in that long scroll going across the screen. Um, it'd be really funny if my phone starts ringing while I'm actually up here. Or, you know, if you don't want to perform but just really want to help us out, please, 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 uh, lakeeffectpoetry.com. There's a donate link. Uh, you can make a donation through PayPal. Or we have a Rocket Hub campaign going for a couple more days. Um, they, they take a bigger cut than PayPal does, just FYI. Which brings me to poetry doesn't pay the bills. I, well, I used to have a day job, and I'm betting most of you have got day jobs of one, one kind or another. It sucks, but you can't live on art alone. So be it. I spent most of my days in a return center warehouse. Customer returns, one after another. Identify the customer, identify the item, identify the return reason, process the return, tag it for inventory, send it down the line. Over and 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 over again. This dress is too small, these shoes are too big. I didn't realize this belt was made of real leather. This zebra print rug wasn't made from real zebra skin. This $14 coffee maker was made in China. I expected it to be made in the USA. This MP3 player stopped working after going through the wash cycle in my pants pocket. This digital camera doesn't have anywhere to load film. Yeah, these are all real. It becomes incredibly monotonous. It gets to the point where you can't remember one item from the next because you are bored as hell. I have a proposition to improve the situation. Stock beer in the break room vending machines. See, all day, every day, we spend nine hours just wanting to leave and go to the bar. All we want to do is get the fuck out of there and go get a drink. Bring the drink to us and we won't need to leave. Productivity would be improved by alcohol's ability to cause short-term memory loss, eliminating the effects of monotony. Instead of dragging through return after return after return after return, each item would be like the first of the day, a brand new experience. Beer in the vending machines would also reduce the number of absences and sick days taken. Most absences are, in fact, not caused by illness. Most sick days are taken as a result of the fuckets. We'd rather stay at home fucking off drinking beer all day than come into work. Beer will also improve the workforce's pain threshold. Lost time due to heavy lifting induced muscle pain, fluorescent light induced migraines, and repetitive motion injury would be drastically reduced. As long as the team continues to drink, we won't be able to feel damn near anything. Once again, increasing productivity. This will also make the post-holiday mandatory overtime much more tolerable. Two or three extra hours a night, six or eight hours on Saturday and Sunday. There won't be anything to complain about if we just work while kicking back a couple Coronas and cranking up some Jimmy Buffett. Since I started doing podcasting back in 07, I've been forced to listen to my own voice a lot. I hate the sound of my voice. You know how you hear yourself one way in your head and then you hear a recording of yourself and, and who the hell is this? See, and I hear myself speak, I've got this kind of bassy, gravelly sound, kind of like a Bon Jovi or Bruce Springsteen voice. 
then I hear my recording and I'm listening to motherfucking Papa Smurf. Seriously, by the time I release a podcast, I have lowered my voice two octaves, slowed it down 7.5%, the bass increased by 15%, the mid-range boosted by 12%, and the peak highs lowered a good 6.5%. Every recording, the same process, over and over and over and over and over again. Which probably explains why the only episodes that ever got released on time were those completed while at a fridge well stocked with beer. Ready, Carla? So just a little bit ago, you read Dan Smith's piece out of the Brant 21 anthology, and guess who walked in just a minute ago? Miss Brant. <laughs> That's how Cleveland works, right? Everything goes in circles. So I'm going to dust off a few pieces that I haven't read in forever. And thank you, Vertigo, for filling in for me. But um, if anybody was actually listening a little while ago, you recall that I did a little poem about being adopted. And then my wonderful birth aunt came in to visit and support our team. I love you. You're so cool. <laughs> The good thing about meeting your family when you're older is that you can pick and choose. <laughs> I'm keeping the cool ones. Okay. And I feel like the lazy poet because I'm the one who keeps sitting down, but that's all right. I'm the one with the bad bag, so that's my excuse. All right. So this one is called Thanks for Giving. Now, I know we're all chit-chatting, but remember, when I'm done, you have to do the cursory uh, clap or snap, all right? Got me, Noah? All right. Thanks for giving. I held the legs open while she poured the salt. It would make an interesting photo, I thought, my grandmother's dark hand splashing against the pale turkey while she taught me her version of how to brine a bird. She seems thinner, still too stubborn to get a hearing aid, and why should she? It's only a pinched nerve. Her wispy disappearing curls yell that we rarely visit. The hunch in her back screams that we never call. My mother usually the source of information for us about her mother. At the meal, all of us are there. We three women play holiday catch up. Absent family members, new jobs, politics float across the table between this year's reincarnation of cranberry sauce, this one has fennel seeds, and two bowls of collard greens. Grandma's blue roomy eyes sparkle. You know why so many Caucasians voted for them, she chuckles over the fried chicken. Because they all had black nannies raising them. She begins to glow going on about the now grown white children that she took such good care of. My mother grows quiet, frozen, seeming to barely notice the stories of hair brushings, dresses with pretty collars, and games played with someone else's daughters while she waited, black and alone, for their Auntie Sarah to get home. Thank you. Ooh, nice. I wrote this one, this is one of the first pieces. So it's like 10 years old. But I do believe that the only bad thing about being biracial is the biracial hair. So, when I grew tall enough, strong enough, brave enough, I cut all that shit off. 
and instantly the nagging notion I had hidden underneath my scalp was proven right. I still breathed, I still had breasts, I was still beautiful. And the world actually did keep on spinning even though my hair was missing. How presumptuous of me to believe otherwise. How naive of me to believe all those who insisted that women were like Samson, losing all traces of femininity with a chopping of the locks. Maybe it came to be that way because what we ain't got always seems to be what you should have. And sisters always had such a hard time growing the stuff. Understand, I am an 80s baby, when all black women either had relaxers or jerry curls. Just let your soul glow. And we bought anything that said it would make it grow. Blue bergamot, pink hair lotion, sulfur eight, how was I supposed to know any different with older, darker women always tugging on my pigtails? Girl, you got that good hair. As decided by who? Who told you that nappy was a negative and dark was only lovely if it came in a box? But what do I know? I got that good hair and no one wants to listen to me. Not my white family, not my black kin being tugged at split from both ends. Oh yes, my Caucasian friends. I know your secret too. I've been on to you, running your fingers through my hair without permission, coveting a level of kink, of blackness you find acceptable. Ooing and aahing with phrases like, I just love your hair. And I can never get mine to do anything. So this insane war wages on and we battle each other, perm to relaxer, curling iron, a straightening comb, hair oil to hairspray because the style is always prettier on the other side of the salon. I believe that even though women were trained from birth to believe otherwise, our soul does not actually reside in any single strand, lock, or braid. And what comes out of our heads does not have to be a statement of pride, self-loathing, or bravado, unless you need it to be. And what you do to it and with it doesn't mean a damn thing, unless you really want it to. I guess I am waiting for the great hair apocalypse when all the chemicals wear off, the last of the weaves have fallen out, and we are all collectively spent from spending that last paycheck at the salon. Maybe then we'll move on realize that the battle was actually within ourselves, that there was never any need to go there. Because after all, in the end, it is just here. Thank you. <laughs> You're my little brother, my new little brother. All right. Another one of those really long poems that slam poets like to write. We take too much time. It's okay. I don't want you to feel like you have to wait the whole time. Okay. All right. This one is called This Isn't Art. I have this theory that we are all expressions of one mind, of the universe, tiny flickers in the flame of this collective consciousness. So when there is any part of your mind that is hurting, it does actually affect the body. Likewise, if there is any part of this larger mind that is hurting or distressed, then we all feel the strain, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. But be aware when you actively ignore, the pain will eventually radiate creating other outlets, leaking into our dreams, our moods, our news, our art. It stains the corners of our individual minds and in time there is blood on the walls, there is dirt on the floors, creating a depression, requiring prescriptions, payments for therapeutic admissions. And most of us can't truly explain or even pronounce what we are crying for. And most of us can't truly explain or even pronounce what people are dying for. We say we fight against terrorism although they weren't terrorizing us. We say freedom, although they weren't the ones taking that from us. We say the American way, but 
Who on the Hill realizes the foresight of our forefathers? Your freedom of speech, religion, press, right to privacy, to knowledge are officially fucking compromised. Floating away on a spin tide, carefully keeping you focused on lies. So the elections aren't about who's been chosen to die, but making sure those fags can't marry each other. Spinning until the American way is dizzily on its way out the door and there is still blood on the walls and dirt on the floors of these prisons of peace and we're okay with that. They keep it far from us in sound bites and snapshots, ticker tape news floating across the bottom of the screen. Tiny news equals tiny meaning equals tiny importance in our grand scheme and we are okay with that. Here, we decide what's important based on sensation. Look at us helping the little boy with no legs. Never mind, we blew them off in the first place. Exploitation until we are bored with it. Don't want to overdo it. I mean, really, uncharged prisoners and panties and hoods is such old news, except for the people who lived through it. But come on, get over it, because we are OK with that. Here, we lay around in acronym oblivion, hand the kid with an iPod as PS3 while we all roll around on our SUVs. I don't care about the future. It's too far from me. And we have actually been OK with that. I think there is irony in the wording. There is irony in the wording, and the wording is diseased. See, before 9-11, there was a desert storm. Kitschy catchphrases make it communal. Now we can buy around, toss it back with a shot, and forget it with our hangovers in the morning, but it's there. Right here, that war on terror, because here we believe that we, the America, doesn't torture. This isn't even your war. We are at war with a concept, but hey, you don't terrorize. You were never a terrorist. You didn't hold them underwater until there was only darkness, did you? You didn't force him to roll around naked in his own waist, did you? No, not you. That was the America. We, we see, no, hear, no, speak, no, but it's still fucking evil. Thank God you don't torture. This is not your war. But damn, if it isn't tucked in the back of your brain, laying on the back of your skull, safe there behind all your other personal shame. Unfortunately, it's bigger than that. It's tucked away, but growing. And it's getting so big, it creeps into your bed while you blame the nightmares on something you ate. I heard a steady diet of bullshit can do that to you. And there's blood on the walls, spreading over dirt-covered floors, staining the artistic landscape. Sing a song and move on. Lucky us, we have our art. It's the easiest way to express. So the viewer and the doer can appreciate it from a distance. So it's on the movie screen now, and it's in paintings now. They wrote songs about it now. It makes for smashing TV, and Lord help me, even poetry. But it's not enough to just sit here now. It's not enough to pay for your movie ticket or read about it now. Now you have to decide what to do. Now you are obligated to learn the truth. Now you must become a real part of this world around you. You must speak and move because this isn't a song anymore. This isn't poetry anymore. Hell, this isn't just art anymore. This is life. Hey there. Hey. Thank you. And that's my husband. Husband, yes. come over here and meet my Aunt Sharon. Right there. <laughs> his, his actual name is Jacob, but he answers to husband. That works. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would if I could whistle. Can you whistle at him? All right. Trying to think, another one of me or somebody else? Either way. Hmm? <laughs> Preferably me. I don't need it, but can I have another cup of coffee? I said I don't really need it, but can I have another cup of coffee? Yeah. I've had a cup. <laughs> My cup is right there. My cup is right there. That little one. So um, once again, just would like to remind everybody that 
we are spouting poetry at you as part of uh, a fun drive for the Lake Effect Poetry Team, your 2012 uh, Cleveland Slam team. And you can donate if you're not here at lakeeffectpoetry.com Lake uh, if you're watching us online. And if you are here, you can help out by uh, being kind to your baristas and, and drinking lots and lots of caffeinated beverages and tipping your poets. It's okay to, to pay the poets this time around. And by purchasing a variety of chapbooks that we have for sale here, there's something for everyone, including coffee. Yay. There's a camera right there. All right. This is a piece called Hostage that I wrote after I realized I hadn't seen a certain friend for much longer than it should have been. Hostage. He won't let me come home. She spoke soft and quick. I remember my panic. How long had she been gone? He was a dealer. Where were her kids? Hadn't they just played with my son yesterday? She was a crackhead. Was she sneaking to make this phone call? What do you mean, girl, where are you? Soft and quick. I gave him Sean's iPod to hold till I get money, but I ain't got no more money. She wanted to get the device back. She wanted to show her son that she wasn't selling pieces of him for a fix, but she was. I repeated, where are you? I'll come get you. I never doubted my ability. I was the good mother. I was a teacher. Of course this man was going to listen to me. I demanded, put him on the phone. So odd in retrospect that he did listen. You see, the man was just a simple-minded boy holding drugs for someone else with a few more brains than him. He told me he just needed the money. Then they could all go home. I repeated, this time for him, where are you? I found myself somewhere on the west side with a strung out friend in the back seat and a not so bright dealer in the front. I've been telling her we needed to go home, ma'am, that I just needed my money. Did he just call me ma'am? How old are you? 19, ma'am. This was followed by his one-sided confessional of the need to do something else, be something else. Maybe, he said, go to church more often. I took him to his block and it was familiar. I had taught around the corner from this block and I knew who worked it. I looked back at my friend, looking out the back window, soft tears moving on a blank face. I wondered, does she have any idea how pretty it is today? I looked at the boy. Tell him that Miss T said not to sell to her anymore. Tell him this one belongs to me, okay? Okay, ma'am, as he moved out the car. She stayed put, staring out the back window, not wanting to move up front. I knew then, even if the man who was really a dumb boy had let her come home sooner, she wouldn't have. I had lied to him. She didn't belong to me. I wasn't enough to compete with what owned her. I repeated, where are you? TM in the house. Hi, honey. Woot. <laughs> you, you know the book was just $6, right? <laughs> Our anthologies go for $100 each. <laughs> okay, quick pause and broadcast.
<laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to do just a couple more pieces, not actually of my own, before I release the microphone for a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's totally OPP right now. Huh? <laughs> Other people's poetry, baby. <laughs> I, I, I can tell this is a good day because Vertigo's getting all hip hop poetry gangsta on me in the background. <laughs> That's right, poetry, baby. What? Uh oh. Uh oh. She just left. She had she had something to go to, but she was very generous. God bless her. So. And anybody else who would like to tip anything, God bless you too. Um, going to read one that I like. I don't know why, I just love it. It's called Insecurities, and it's from the chapbook Foreclosure Dogs by Andrew, um, and I always say Rin, it's right. R Rin or Ryan? Andrew Ryan. Andrew, R-I-H-N. Andrew, I hope you're watching. I still love your poetry, it hasn't changed. Insecurities. You read so much that you begin to forget what you like and what you dislike. Simply keep reading to keep up the flow of information to stave off the threat of normalcy. The same way you stop buying regular milk and instead buy lactose-free soy milk, not because of intolerance, but for a taste out of the ordinary. The same way I worry you might find your way into a hotel room without me, double checking that sex is just as laughable with someone else. When we visit the independent bookstore, you purchase a copy of The Graduate, and I begin to think you linger too long at the counter, that you laugh a little too easily at the clerk's bad jokes. If you ever wondered how he makes a living, well, there is pornography in the back room. Snaps for Andrew. Snapping for porn, okay, or for pornography, whichever. Porn, yeah. Jesus, Lord of mercy. How much did my aunt donate? It's beautiful, beautiful. Huh? Did I? Like 50, 100, something like that, 50? 100. As of right now, we are 20% towards our minimum requirement just to make the trip. <laughs> we can do this, right? We can totally do this. Okay, um, the last piece I'm gonna share before I take a deodorant break is, everybody's gotta freshen up now and then. Um, this isn't actually a low po local poet. This is um, one by Sherman Alexi. Um, yeah, I just love him. He's so awesome. And this is called In the Matter of Human Versus Bee. Um, it starts with a quote. If the bee dies, man dies within four years. And it's a quote attributed to Albert Einstein, but which was likely created by an anonymous source for political reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, for the prosecution, the bees are gone. Who gives a shit? Other insects and animals can pollinate all the flora. We will survive because humans are adaptable. The bees are gone. It's a problem, but one will solve with good science and ambition. Certain bees have disappeared, but the other, more solitary breeds of bee are still alive and pollinating like porno stars. Who needs the bees that are too weak? Perhaps Darwin should be quoted to prove our point. The bees are gone, but won't stronger pollinators grow in number and amorous intensity? If you believe in a good God, as anyone should, then you must know that God will create more bees or replace them with something else equally good because God is infallible. Two, for the defense. The bees are gone. No one knows why, not even God. Some blame cell phones. Some blame disease. A few blame God. 
the bees are gone. No one knows why. If they stay gone, all flora goes without pollen and will perish, starved and godless within four years. The animals will soon follow flora to dust, and then we die. Nothing can stay because the bees are little gods who gave us grace, bloom by bloom. The bees are gone. I sing the song to bring them back or say goodbye or to worship the empty sky. Three, for the beekeepers. The bees are gone. We need new bees or we are fucked. <laughs> Save the bees. That'll be a separate fundraiser later on for the bees. Um, are we going to take a short break or are we going to bring up, need a moment? <laughs> oh my goodness. Hi. All right. I'm going to step away and, and do my deodorant check. And in just a moment, the wonderful TM Goddle, another member from your Lake Effect Poetry Slam team, will be up here blessing us with her wonderful voice and ability for amazing metaphor. <laughs> All right. Before she gets up here, let's take a moment to tell everybody here and everybody watching at home, if you can't make it here today, uh, the team's send-off performance will be this coming Friday in Canton, Ohio. 223 Fifth Street Northwest. It's the corner of Fifth and Cleveland Avenue. Um, it's under the three big faces. It's called uh, Shattered Expressions. It's the, the building directly under those. Um, that'll be, it's Canton's First Friday Poetry Spectacular. We have an open mic. We'll have the feature performance by the team, including material that they're not allowed to read here tonight because we're, because of the live broadcast. We don't want our competition knowing what we're, what we're bringing to Charlotte. And then we have a poetry slam with $50 to first place, 30 to second, 20 to third, thanks to Arts and Stark. They, they sponsor that and let us do that every month. Um, again, it's the corner of Fifth Street Northwest and Cleveland Avenue. Hopefully the bleachers for the uh, Hall of Fame stuff won't, won't make us too hard to see there. Um, and again, lakeeffectpoetry.com. It's a PayPal donation link there. And now I pass the stage off to Cleveland's Grand Slam champion, T.M. Goddle. Hello, Coffee Fix. Hello, Internet. <laughs> Greetings to the world. I guess this is the TM Goddle interlude. Um, I'm gonna read, uh, I'm gonna start off by reading a couple of things that are actually some of my newer, newer pieces that you won't be hearing at nationals, but uh, just some newer stuff here. Does everybody know what fracking is? Fracking, yeah. If you don't know what fracking is, it's um, a terrible, terrible process by which they uh, extract natural gas from the ground by means of uh, injecting chemicals and terrible things into the shale. And uh, it, it's terrible for the environment, it's terrible for people. And I wrote a poem in response to that. The muddy brown road unfurled her tongue at the feet of the little green river god. And the tiny yellow spider, barely a sun speck, covers dusty altars in animal skins, paying his dues and respects to the little green river god. Broken flashlights make dizzy the maple helicopters while the little green river god goes questing for vision angels in motor oil and coffee. And the voices say, Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Senator. 
Ankle deep in the eddies, little green river god looks up with casino token eyes into crabapple blossoms and Christmas bulbs, antique chipped colors, watching faces lapse in the glass globes. Little Green River God, do you hear the hatred trumpets busting snow from the sky? I pray you packed your passport. This is not Miner's Town. These people breathe generations of salt rock, steel mill, acid rain, but not you. Not you. And the voices say, we thought this was all about jobs. No. Stop. You weren't paying attention. Three-sided segments of mirror and orange fragments of headlamp shatter replace the acorn caps and birch bark scrolls that used to tile the floors in the house of the Little Green River God. Little Green River God, you will never leave. You need these lands. You need the thankless hands that scar your home. And the voices say, thank you, Madam Representative. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Little Green River God runs out of time for wild asparagus and recess jump rope chanting. And the voices say, I thought this was supposed to be easy. No, stop. You weren't paying attention. The black-eyed Susans cry themselves white while the cattails dance their farewell waltz, a triolet rhythm, left, right, left, 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 right, left, right, at the threshold of the Little Green River God. The red-winged blackbird sang today, a springtime dirge for the little green river god, a springtime dirge in a shiny plastic cathedral. And the voices say, thank you, Mr. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Little green river god can't stay long with our seismic testing and our geolithic lies. Little green river god, you'd better run. And the voices say, dear Mr. No, stop. You weren't paying attention. The voices say, thank you for your letter concerning, no, stop. You weren't paying attention. The voices say, to date, there is still no scientific evidence that, no, stop. You weren't paying attention. The horsemen don't ride black stallions anymore. They drive fleets of semis, 15 desert pink cabs with well services and oil field equipment stenciled on their sides. They recline in the driver's seat but still wearing white or red or black, still bearing pestilence, war and famine. Their cigarettes never burn to the filter. Little Green River God, you'd better run. And the voices say, Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Governor. No, stop. You need to start paying attention before there is no more green, no more rivers, and no more gods. Thank you. Uh, so we are here. Uh, raising money during our marathon for the Lake Effect Poetry Slam team as we make our way to Charlotte next week, actually. It's, it's coming up. So um, we are accepting donations online via PayPal, um, through our website. We are accepting donations here in person. So if you want to come down to South Euclid and join us at Coffee Fix, um, we are still selling time slots. So. Anyone who wants to read, perform, sing, dance. If you have dancing dogs that do tricks, you know, feel free. Um, all are welcome. Uh, Vertigo said, if you have the dimes, we've got the time. So. I am not a writer. I don't worship at glass clock towers. I don't kneel in rivers. I am not brave. I took dictation requests from angels and other guardians, but once offended, they never return. I offered 10,000 Hail Marys. I offered loaves of bread with apricots and figs on plates of silver, but I am not forgiven. I am not brave enough to be a writer. 
I buried my 40 talents in the field so the magpies and raccoons could line their nests and dens with god gold. I store my demons between my teeth instead of painting them on my face or pinning them to my jacket. I don't speak cleanly enough for memorials. I don't know the tale of the solar arc or the webbing between a frog's toes. I can't be expected to remember all the promises I've made, and I can't keep them secret and safe. I am not brave. People make wars so historians and presidents can keep their jobs. If I squint, the word property looks like profits. The congressmen cover their paper mache women in hundred dollar bills, but I don't need to be a writer. I am not a dangerous person. I don't need to be brave to say any of that. People want a resurrection frenzy. They want to hear someone brave say, I just had a resurrection last week, and hear another brave person say, that's nothing. I had three resurrections just last month. They want resurrections. They want clean executions. They want a good story. They want blood. Holy men are drinking kerosene in the marketplaces for the blackness of despair, for the salt of pleading, for the cool rains of hope. But I can't even say, I think you are wrong. I'd rather wear the skins of lions I never killed and build my house out of bones handed to me by senators. I accept them, plaster them into the walls, unquestioning why the teeth are so small, unquestioning why the rib cage is broken, unquestioning. I am not brave. I've forgotten that at night you can see everything. I'm going to read a piece here that is in this booklet here, which can be purchased today. Um, it includes all of our teammates. Um, it has some fantastic poetry from all members who made the Lake Effect Slam team. And this piece is called Survivors. You will only kill the mosquito or the spider as long as you do not see that you need the mosquito and the spider to survive. You will only torture the birds as long as you do not see that your life will be tortured so long as they suffer at your hands. A creature born with legs needs to run, a creature born with wings needs to fly, and a creature born with a voice needs to speak the truth. The world is a curious place when heroes and saints die by the same rules so that we can name highways and tall buildings after them. But we'll run out of highways and tall buildings before we run out of names. The kings and their makers don't care. The prophets are dying. The white stag and the black doe cross the river, the waterfalls, cobblestone stars to the other side. In the warhouse, the Jesuits walk the floor of oil, locking a hornet named Lucifer in a cage of volcanic glass and dragging a red wagon with two bodies through the sun door. We are killing our prophets. I find myself stuck in a machine milking paper for a paperless world. I've already missed three funerals. I am haunted by the wolves, but I asked to be haunted. There are no more safe places to say I do not agree. After 30, I can't see clearly anymore. The days of rock and roll and crime break my heart again and again and again. These are the rules of damage that no one needed to tell me. Don't try kissing the leopards. Don't try taming the onagers. Don't try wrestling with peacocks. Lay low. Just lay low and don't let them see you. Our prophets are killing themselves. Sometimes there are easy answers. Sometimes the easy answers are not right. And shaking my own fist at the rain, expecting the clouds to stop, I am the problem. Today will be someone else's golden age. They will envy us, but we can only look back. Everything stops if you let it. 
The comet Lovejoy flew into the sun, atomic heart of plasma from which nothing should ever escape, and it emerged on the other side, scarred and wiser, but alive. So today, I choose the light. I am getting out, and I am getting out alive. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read some things that I did not write. This is a, a book of poems called The Gift by the poet Hafiz. The Vintage Man. The difference between a good artist and a great one is the novice will often lay down his tool or brush, then pick up an invisible club on the mind's table and helplessly smash the easels in jade. Whereas the vintage man no longer hurts himself or anyone and keeps on sculpting light. everywhere. Running through the streets, screaming, throwing rocks through windows, using my own head to ring great bells, pulling out my hair, tearing off my clothes, tying everything I own to a stick and setting it on fire. What else can Hafiz do tonight to celebrate the madness, the joy of seeing God everywhere? Thank you again to Coffee Fix for hosting us today and making it possible for us to uh, stage this 12-hour this marathon fundraiser. Please tip generously. So many gifts. There are so many gifts still unopened from your birthday. There are so many handcrafted presents that have been sent to you by God. The beloved does not mind repeating, everything I have is also yours. Please forgive Hafiz and the friend. If we break into a sweet laughter when your heart complains of being thirsty, when ages ago every cell in your soul capsized forever into this infinite golden sea. Indeed, a lover's pain is like holding one's breath too long in the middle of a vital performance, in the middle of one's of creation's favorite songs. Indeed, a lover's pain is this sleeping, this sleeping, when God just rolled over and gave you such a big good morning kiss. There are so many gifts, my dear, still unopened from your birthday. Oh, there are so many handcrafted presents that have been sent to your life. This is one of my favorite poets, um, Czeslav Milos. Uh, he is, he was a, a Nobel Prize winner and just written lots and lots of really, really fantastic stuff. Idea. A foot on horseback with bugles and baying hounds, we look down at last on the wilderness of the idea. Sulfur yellow like an aspen forest in late fall, if the memory of a previous life does not deceive me. Though it was not a wood, but a tangle of inorganic forms, chlorine vapor and mer mercury and iridescence of crystals. I glanced at our company, bows, muskets, a five-shot rifle, here and there a sling, and the outfits the latest fashions from the year 1000, or for a variety, top hats such as Kierkegaard, the preacher, used to wear on his walks. Not an imposing crew. Though, in fact, the idea was dangerous to our kind no more, even in its lair. To assault poor shepherds, farmhands, lumberjacks was its specialty, 
since it had changed, it ha changed its habits. And the youngsters above all, tormenting them with dreams of justice on earth and the island of the sun. Account. The history of my stupidity would fill many volumes. Some would be devoted to acting against consciousness, like the flight of a moth which, had it known, would have tended nevertheless toward the candle's flame. Others would deal with ways to silence anxiety, the little whisper which, though it is a warning, is ignored. I would deal separately with satisfaction and pride, the time when I was among their adherents who strut victoriously, unsuspecting. But all of them would have one subject, desire, if only my own, but no, not at all. Alas, I was driven because I wanted to be like others. I was afraid of what was wild and indecent in me. The history of my stupidity will not be written. For one thing, it's late, and the truth is laborious. And let's see. I'll read one more from here. The Spirit of the Laws. From the cry of children on the floors of stations beyond time, from the sadness of the engineer of prison trains, from the red scars of two wars on the forehead, I awoke under the bronze of winged monuments, under the griffins of a Masonic temple with the dying ash of a cigar. It was a summer of plain trees and colonnades and pearls of birds poured from the dawn, a summer of joined hands, of black, of violet, a summer of blue bees, of whistles, of flames, and the tiny propellers of a hummingbird. And I, with my pine anchor on a sandy plain, with the silenced memory of dead friends and the silenced memory of towns and rivers, I was ready to tear out the heart of the earth with a knife and put there a glowing diamond of shouts and complaints. I was ready to smear the bottom of roots with blood, to invoke the names on their leaves, to cover the malachite of monuments with the skin of night, and write down with phosphorus many tekel upharshen, shining with the traces of melting eyelids. I could go to the riverside where lovers look at the remnants of games floating to the sea. I could enter parking lots, iridescent soap bubbles, and listen to the laboring of the eternal humanity of muted notes of industrious, agile male muscles over a hot butterfly of carmine, gardens hopping down to the bottom of ravines, the national dances of gray squirrels in the white laboratories of winged infants always growing up in a different epoch. The shine, the juice, the rough of the day, all of it seemed to be the beginning of the sun on yellow plains where in railway stations at a wobbling table, sitting over an empty glass, their faces in their hands, are the sad engineers of prison trains. So that's, that's Cheslav Milos. I'm gonna read some of my older stuff. This is um, Stretching the Window. You can purchase it from the Poets Haven. What's that? From the Poets Haven at a third off the cover price. It's a steal. Get one today. I'm worn from chasing after evaporating rainbows and unicorns charging with paper mache horns and fairies whose wings have been plucked. The heroes here all wear moth-eaten capes, and the prophets, sharing their blessed tongues, wake up next to bloodied swords between their sheets. 
If I drop the silver weights from my ears, the trees have promised me a perfect, round, white city. But it doesn't matter. The saints don't listen. Even after offerings of automated mansions and gold-plated automobiles and 17 weeks of fasting beneath a full moon, they never foreclose on our debts. I know that doves never cry at night, nor do they linger near the dinner plates of emperors. And even the false gods, those gluttonous concrete monuments, live in smoke-damaged temples guarded by priests who paint lies across their eyes. Treaties were signed under ringing bells and bonfire light, but the scars of old footprints were never repaved under streets of crystal glass. Thieves unlatched all the cages, freeing many colored things with feathers and fur and bright golden eyes. And come morning, they handed the cages back, filled instead with small devils who chase us out the windows and off of rooftops, falling up and falling down and even falling sideways just to see what it feels like to, to either fly or collide. So again, I ask, with black ribbons tied around my wrists, while the brokers chop my feet from my ankles, please send tomorrow, just one tomorrow, because the rivers never know if they are leaving or returning home again. Thank you. Thank you, teammates. Lake effect. I think you were supposed to whoop. Should we take it a little more around? Uh, I don't know. We, we, can, we can be more subdued, you know. It's all good, too. This, is, this can be our laid back hour, you know. So this is the chill hour. Smooth poetry. Um. My family uh, used to take vacations to uh, the beach of North Carolina every summer, and this is about one of those summers. Sandals and flashlights and dune grass and darkness. Children and their adults both drop dabs of light spilled and rolling, bouncing from the dunes to the glowing salt line where moonlight and water bugs fuel the tide pools that deconstruct all of our yesterdays. The time here has a habit of evaporating, like a camouflaged spook twisted around the palm leaves or stuck and hiding beneath the pier. With their squinting windows, the beach cabins watch you and the other distracted excursionists, trailing red or yellow plastic buckets and two-dollar mossy fishing nets through the dark. A sound like a cello rubs across the sky and pulls your eyes east to a fishing boat whose rigging is snagged between the water and the starshine, calling out with a signal light, hoping to sail home, skimming Slavic, melody, skimming Slavic melodies. Down the beach you hear a shuffling and a ten-year-old yelp, one more ghost crab trapped in a bucket of flashlight beams. No more building castles or digging jewel-studded dungeons. The sand gnomes have lost one more tenant tonight. And you just saunter through their city, wondering what sandpiper princesses might live at the top of a seashell staircase. The nomads. Once every year, the nomads file into my warehouse with eyes of the hunted, eyes of prey. They're stapled to every last bit of love they own, and they come to barter globes and crystal salt shakers and faded names painted on cinder blocks, a market of objects crowded with the magic and love of distance and travel. These are the kings and dukes, the noble folk and the aristocrats who drop pinpricks and tear stains across wood and strings and brass, sitting in circles, eating bread and drinking exotic teas, brewed of scalding water and lilacs. They whisper, afraid of the eavesdropping echoes, rocking their teacups full of misconceptions. They shake hands, exchange incantations, 
cast prayers like moths and arrows across blended steel curls and black ribbons and golden barbs. Here, there are no secrets, no knowledge of plastics or circuitry, just the ageless wonder at fruit veins or insect wings and the alchemy that one can access with bare-soled feet pressed into the dewy grass. very quiet, so I'm going to get loud for a second. Romeo discerned with a swampy eye. It's the nunnery for you, my dear. No surgical alterations or cupboards full of plastic knives, yay? It's the nunnery for you, my dear. So I punched him in the front teeth. You soggy excuse for a used tea bag, I retorted with salt rocks and chlorine. You couldn't hear hyenas dying at your boxer shorts or notice the black flies camping out in your nostrils, building tiny bonfires, roasting marshmallows. Can't you smell the marshmallows? Hopeless, hopeless. There's some news from the cookie jar, Mr. Five to Nine, solitaire on live, remote potato salad twongs with a twist of hay. That's my change in a swollen fourth toe. Why don't you just run that sugary little tuxedo through the riding mower before I loose the coffee grounds and parakeets to have their way with your polyester shiny oxfords on on your way down the alfalfa chute. <laughs> yeah, it did. That's right. The rabbits of St. Joseph. We used to be young in basements and parlors and bedrooms, but now we are gray and in the kitchen, under the dusty cricketing lights, my thumb slowly stroking the finish from my coffee cup. You've poured my grandmother's jar of starfish and beach glass on the table between us. Each rounded trapezoid and bead wraps around an oblique memory frozen as in amber. You and I finger them, our hands hot from the past and the talk and the coffee, melting the glass and the little petrified squares stolen from the minds of friends and strangers, flap their wings and leave through the open window. Butterflies and white doves and silver bats that stick to the sky, building new constellations, arching over the day when black lions broke down doors, demanding a father too young and a small girl too old like some sepia-toned drama. You and I were only children then, draping sharp battle robes across t-shirts and jeans, fighting with sticks and swords and arrows and dynamite while fear crawled through the keyholes, through our ears, and we ran. We ran excavating prayers from beneath wooden pianos and unearthing a shaky old cigar box filled with sleeping souls. Once awakened, they sold us a train ticket bound for the edge of the world. The steel heart beat through our feet and our minds, bending consciousness in the sculpted metal corners until we stepped off, tumbling into St. Joseph's grass, a garden of overlapping mirrors and toppled crosses. The yard had grown thickly with statues and old elfin magic guarded by the beatified rabbits who swam rivers and climbed temples who flew and disappeared. Beneath those 100 pairs of brown eyes, you wrote your hopes across my face, the felt pen tickling the bridge of my nose before we ran into the sea. Two gulls destined for immortality, pushing through enchanted oil curtains and into second space. Thank you. So this is the Sunday fun day fundraiser for the Lake Effect. I, I, don't, I can't remember the, was that right? The fun, Sunday Fun Day fundraiser. Um, all, that. all that for Cleveland's only um, slam team that will be competing at nationals in Charlotte next week. Um, so we are still, 
That's us. We are still looking for donations. We have a tip jar up here. You can still purchase time today if you'd like to read your own poetry, sing your own songs, perform, dance, do gymnastics, whatever it is that you do. If you perform um, and you'd like to buy a time slot, we will gladly let you perform. And you can perform to our online audience as well. There are five people watching. Hello to the world. And I'm sure we will have more folks watching throughout the day as well. So um, please, 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 if you are interested, thank you. Hooray. Woot. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So we will see him again then. I'll be looking forward to that. So, I'm going to stand up for this one. Time and the march of army boots and metal chairs in the midnight howl of a panther train. Time and the sea lord calling back the herds in the seventh breaking of the hardwood stair. Time and a white coat cigarettes and coffee. Time in the refrigerated cellular automotive facsimile liquid crystal satellite malfunction. Time and the lack of confidence reflected in faded cathedral glass. Time in aluminum eagle wings and the painted skydivers and the telescoping highways. Time and a minted piece and a pine cone rustle and a chipmunk's soul. Time because everyone's written a poem about heartbreak in an empty hotel room. Time and the concrete lions and the telephone poles and the copper, copper saxophone strings. Time and the burning pages, the empty bottles, the distorted static music. Time and the black keys, white keys, gray keys, colored keys, computer keys, car keys, house keys, major keys, minor keys. Time and the red ink and the black water. Time through a glass, around your neck, under your feet, and in your pockets. Time in a house without ceilings, a front lawn full of hands, and a basement full of feet and folded prayers. Time and a red paper kite hunting through the starshine. Thank you. This is the very first poem I wrote that um, ever won anything. So that was pretty exciting the first time you actually get money for something that you've written. And you're like, yeah, I've arrived. <laughs> this is called Searching for the Big Skies. I told you last week that someone planted a plaster virgin mother in a flower bed behind some leafy red cabbage with a fiberglass reindeer shepherding the entire array. And of all the dispersing pedestrians, not one saw anything perverse or faulty, just continued blinking into the sunspots, flipping the red and orange radio frequencies in their heads. But when you heard the Christmas geese drifting past your window on that hot green night at 2 a.m., you finally believed the truth. The Ohio skies are shrinking. And the starlings, like so many copper petals and gongs, heard that same sonic boom evacuating on hot feet and spicy wings from the wicked flames invading their tall grass, smoking like violated oil wells and sad automobile tires, lost and wandering between the cookie cutters in a steel and vinyl suburb. You told me how you climbed a hill, hoping that it might roll over, scratching in its soporific adventures, and either gently or growling, it might have offered you some direction. It wasn't even a real hill, just a mound of construction site refugees, a bed of roughhousing for backhoes and bulldogs. Remember when we used to leave landscaping to the migrating herds and the gods of lava and tectonic cultivation before we flew the banners of cartoon heroes from our flagpoles and glued stickers of frogs in the concrete next to the sanitary sewers? 
You told me how the rocks all started cracking and buzzing because some chimera had trapped the black and yellow grasshoppers inside before they had the chance to follow the starlings as the sky kept growing smaller and smaller. Do I keep going? All right. We're going to pause for station identification. <laughs> You're watching the Lake Effect Poetry Sunday Fun Day Fundraiser. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, I kind of like saying it now. Sunday Fun Day Fundraiser, Sunday Fun Day Fundraiser, Sunday Fun Day Fundraiser. Fun Drive. <sighs> Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. OK, I got it now. Um, so please consider giving us a donation. We're accepting tips. We're accepting um, time. Uh, we're still accepting uh, time slots. If you'd like to buy a time slot to perform whatever it is that you perform, um, and we're accepting donations online on our website. So please check us out. And Carla Thompson will be coming up next. We're going to see how much damage I can do with a few of my poems and a lot of other people's. All right. <gasps> OK. That's awesome. Hi, Jean. <laughs> I am so excited about the different people. <laughs> and, huh? No, not hygiene like that. I meant, wow. Wow, only a poet would come up with that one. I'm clean-ish. I, I wore sort of enough deodorant, and I've already dabbed the pits, so we're good to go. But feel free to get a, a beverage, relax for a moment. Oh, okay, I'll let you know. So um, as we have more wonderful people come in to support us, I'll explain a few things. Hi, Steve. Um, so this is, hi, yay, superstar. This is our fundraiser for the Lake Effect Poetry Team. Um, we are looking for enthusiastic readers, performers, sponsors, and audience members. So um, as you're here, Keep pretending that you're interested in the poetry, and whenever you hear a pause on the mic, you clap or snap a little bit, and that makes the person up here feel like they're being loved and paid attention to. Right, Arnie? It works. Yeah. OK. Um, and the various ways that you can support the team actually getting to nationals and hopefully representing you and making you look good, like, you know, Cleveland has a clue what's going on with poetry, <laughs> is by you can either tip. Um, tip your poets, or you can sponsor a poet. If you know somebody would like some time up and you want to just donate some money to get them some time on the mic, or you can purchase any material that we have here. Um, Vertigo has a variety of chat books for sale, including the Lake Effect Poetry Team Anthology, which is $6. And you can also purchase that or make a donation online at lakeeffectpoetry.com. I got that right. Oh, free shipping on the website. Free shipping is good for the, the, for the anthology. Awesome. All right. So all my people that are down in Canton, hi. If you couldn't make it up, go ahead and use your little PayPal account that you know you have. Buy your anthology. Get your free shipping. All right. Uh, let's see. So like I said, I'm going to do a little mix of other people's stuff and my stuff. And I wanted to start with some works from the 2012 Hessler Anthology that I really enjoyed. I have a variety of interesting, interesting poetry books, so I'll share some of this stuff with you. Uh, and these are all, for the most part, local poets. 
I won't read the ones by other poets that are already here in case they want to read their pieces. But just a few of my, the ones that stand out to me. This one is entitled, My Conversation with the Bottles, exclamation point, uh, by Christine D'Onofrio. The bottle has always been prominent in my life. The people that I know go to the bottle for help, for relief, for comfort. I remember the guy, Bob, who used to visit my mom when she tended bar as a second job. Bob really liked the different bottles. He would tell me to get to know Jack, Jameson, and tequila when I got old enough to drink. Bob tried to warn me these bottles, if I let them, would become my friends of low places when I myself got low. I never believed Bob until now. I visit the bottom of different bottles on many occasions. Sometimes the bottles are the only comforts I have as I sit and drink alone. I never grow lonely. The bottles are there. <laughs> Thank you. Another one that I just like the feel of. Uh, this one is called Every Morning I Kill 10,000 Angels by Christine Howie, and I'm hope I'm Christine that I'm pronouncing your name right. She'll be here later. Should I not read her poem? Okay. Well, I mean, it's two different interpretations of the same piece in case. All right, there you go. So, Christine, I hope you don't mind that I love your poem. Every morning I kill 10,000 angels. I don't mean to, but they're everywhere. I crush a couple as I roll over in bed. Then a few more expire as I set down my cereal bowl. Scores are drowned in the shower and a couple dozen strangled in my shoelaces. And once I'm on the internet, they course over the cliff edge by the hundreds, plummet and are crushed despite their wings. I don't blame myself exactly, but still, I wish I had never had the thought that every second is another angel, one more blessed chance to get something right, or to find one thread of thought, original or not, and spin it into something unexpected. It seemed a pleasant conceit at the time, but now it only leaves me with carnage, remnants of white fluff everywhere, and I haven't even told you about the afternoon yet. Woot. And I'm only uh, what you would call beginning middle age. At least that's what I call it. <laughs> but <laughs> don't you look at me, Jean. <laughs> 40 is the new 20. I'm almost 20. Um, and, but I love pieces about getting older. I don't know why. Maybe it just makes me feel like 40 is the new 20. Um, and this is a shorter piece by Dave Stringer entitled Retirement. Jean, thank you. You look so lovely as usual. Retirement. A potluck lunch and a gift card, everyone walking the other way, closing the door behind them. It's time to go. 30 years of it's what I do. Got to be at work in the morning and a reason to get out of bed. Now it's on me to fill one more minute and make my own meaning with my morning eggs. Uh-oh, the chess playing has begun. <laughs> and for anybody who's ever lived in the suburbs and gotten really pissed off that your neighbors do more lawn work than you, can't stand them. Don't they have kids or jobs? I don't get it. Anyway, The Last Weed. This is by Mary Terzillo. I said it right. Yay. Okay. Lovers and Killers by Mary Terzillo. This will be in her upcoming anthology. The Last Weed. Gardeners all over the U.S. celebrate tonight. Except for specimens and contaminant labs, the last weed in North America was just exterminated. Mrs. Hazel Hlupke of Parma, Ohio, says she battled the creeping Charlie under a licensed shrub for months. 
Mrs. Lupke gushed gratitude when the lawn police arrived with blow torches and radioactive implants. Said she had tried pea rune, but her grandbaby had convulsions. And she thought there might be a connection. I asked her, why do you wait so long? Reports Lieutenant Baxter Kilthrush, responding officer. Mrs. Lupke holds up a bottle of pea rune. You know, Paraquat is cheap in this brand. It has a Qmart price sticker. Has such a nice fragrance. Victory for horticulture. No more Canada thistle, chickweed, crabgrass, nettles. Sorry, listeners. Are you cringing? No more itchy ankles. No unsightly patches of tiny purple flowers. Our nation just, just one green and gorgeous velvet billiard table. Except when August dries it, a nice shade of snuff. In other news, US Customs arrests a 10-year-old for smuggling a dandelion in from France. Elsewhere, in a Caltech level four contaminant lab, a clover specimen spontaneously develops 13 leaves and teeth. I love her. Okay, Vertigo said I could get away with calling the last poet I'm going to read from the Hessler anthology, Eva X. Xanthopolis? Yes, or Eva Xanthopolis. All right. And this one is called Cremation. When I die, don't do a thing. Just cremate my mouth. But crucify my tongue. Let it unravel down marble, cross like rug Carpathian with lines and lines of rhymes, crying and reviving words stitched on. Use white and black thread. Metaphors are the true painters. Allow them to speak for mouthless me. When I die, look at these words I wrote how their permanence permeates like echoes in tunnel of infinity. When I die, know that I didn't. Death's just an exposal of gray spirit that was dermis ridden, my true essence hidden no longer. I like that. Whew. Okay. Can I get a time check from someone? 10 to 3? Okay, we're doing good. I don't have to be home until 4 when the baby wakes up from nap. All right. Because <laughs> that's the process of my life now. It revolves around nap time and poop. <laughs> so that's what happens after 40, right? <laughs> Nap time and poop. <laughs> I love it. All right. Um, I wrote this after um, a really good friend of mine. Um, we had a conversation, then shortly thereafter, he had a heart attack. But he, he is still with us. Uh, you know, Brennis. Okay. So this is for uh, Brennis Booth down at Second April Art Gallery. And it's entitled Sneaking Cigarettes at Jesus Camp. You know, he said as he stubbed it out, if it happened, it would be all right. I would be all right. I've never been too thrilled with being here anyway. I think he saw it then. A twitch of the lip, a furrowed brow, a trick of the skin I failed to control, betraying my calm voice, but I would miss you. And no matter the phrases he used, mention of times that were not so bad, comments about those he really did love, there was still no talk of bonds strong enough to make him resist flying away. But I would miss you was all I had to offer. We'd known each other for years, but I had just realized how well this friend fit, and I thought, we cannot be as brief as a smoke break. Okay. 
Um, so I just sat through a, a poetry workshop where a friend of mine was talking to my students and she explained, you know, that um, it's really hard to coach people when you know, you, you talk to them about their writing and they say, but this is exactly how it happened or this is just what they said. And that isn't necessarily always the best thing to put in your poem. And unfortunately this poem is full of, this is just how it happened and that's exactly what <laughs> he said. But I've given up because I just, We'll say it was therapy, and it was the best way to get it out for me. So, um, this is called processing, and it's for all the victims there and not there, survivors and non-survivors of the Copley massacre. After my brother screamed at me for taking a walk down the street with his daughter, my niece. Angry, insidious words, accusing sputters in the middle of the street for all the neighbors to hear, just like they do on talk shows. I left him. I left his home, my niece. I didn't speak to him for three months. How, I wondered to anyone who would listen with my, in, to my indignation, could he treat me that way? When I finally deemed it appropriate to converse with him, he did not apologize. Exactly. He cleared his throat and between anxious coughs, told me about his job. Before our family gathering, before we stopped speaking, before I wouldn't return his calls, he had met a dead man. The news called him mad, and no one knows if Rebecca was going to leave Madman, but he shot her first. Then anyone else he could find close by, an uncle, two teenage girls, a total of seven others, including her 11-year-old nephew, Scott, Madman followed Scott across yards, down streets, into the basement of a stranger's home that he was only permitted to enter after holding a gun to a mother's head, demanding that she and her three kids get the fuck out, so they did. Except her son, Scott's new friend. He was nine and chose to stay. He stayed beside Scott in front of a madman, down in a basement, behind a water heater he stayed. With the gun and the threats and the shooting and the blood, he stayed so that Scott didn't have to die alone. He was nine, my brother said again, and coughed. It wasn't an apology from him or me, but I think he heard my tears, my shame. I never watched TV. I rarely asked the particulars of his work. I didn't seem to get along with cops any better now that my brother was one. I didn't know a madman had happened or that my baby brother would be the first one on the scene, the first to find a bloody little boy tucked away in a basement, the first to process what couldn't be. He coughed. I wanted to pull him through the phone, protect him from that nightmare, be the big sister when he needed comfort. I wanted to be a bit more like a little boy that was smart enough to sense fear, recognize pain and panic, and be strong enough to stay. Thank you.
Alright. So, like I mentioned earlier, most of my poems kind of revolve around the idea of being a mother and or uh, being a teacher. I have one, one third theme, and that would be like mad rabbit feminist, but I don't actually find a problem with that. Uh, so, this is my latest experience with people that really don't appreciate that notion. Um, and this is called Bulletproof. At first, the people didn't believe in me. How could they when I didn't believe in myself? In the early days, I donned the costume, red, blue, and gold nylon stretched over my five-year-old frame, regalia worn thin until it split seams from overuse. By then, I had read enough of all the comics. I knew we were powerful, mysterious. Hell, we could stop bullets with bracelets and do the work of running an island paradise while still looking feminine, almost dainty. Back then, I believed. It wasn't until I was older, ready to do that most feminine thing of all, bring a child into this world, when they started to call me names. They looked at me like I had two heads and neither one of them had any brains. Many got indignant, chimed in that I was crazy, potentially harmful to society. They were not disgusted with the usual, not my race or social class. My age was deemed problematic, but acceptable. My economic status, problematic, but acceptable. After all, I didn't have 19 and counting. I was no octomom addicted to attention or having mouths to feed. I wasn't even doing this alone, but I wanted to have my baby at home. And this, people, is a problem. What I had failed to realize was that after thousands of years of giving birth without drugs, epidurals, or inducements that centered on a doctor's schedule, hell, without even having doctors, we had reached the glorious point in our evolution when people who are trained to be healers convinced over half of America's population that our vaginas had given up. The utility of our uteruses was questionable. Our tubes had tied themselves in knots, and our bodies were no longer capable of doing this miracle without it being a procedure. We had been denigrated and demoralized to the point that more than one in three of us decided to have ourselves sliced open. An infant's first experiences of the outside world, a blade, the brutal destruction of his home, the cold touch of surgical gloves in a glaring light, masked faces making sure his apgars up to par before he can be held by his mother, rocked by a father. So we sit desolate in the land of the free with a higher infant mortality rate than most third world countries, but this is so much less than we are capable of. What it really was, was nine hours. Nine hours of my husband drawing me baths and showers. Nine hours of my bedroom, my clothes. Nine hours of shoulder rubs and old school hip hop. No, I don't mean to romanticize. There was also an hour of, oh my God, of tsunamis, of back spasms, of wait, stop, help, I can't. But I could, and I did. And he was tiny and wrinkly and ugly and gorgeous. He was every cliche of everything perfect. I had set my body about the business of being God, and the results were good. And what else the doctors don't tell you is that the endorphins that your anatomy tosses at you right then are better than heroin, better than weed and an expensive bottle of wine. I wanted to take my birth and bag that shit up, sell it on the corner. I swear you'd all be hooked. And the rest, the rest that follows that much work, I slept the sleep of Roman conquerors. There was pain and some bloodshed, but I was strong and capable and victorious. I was Achilles with breasts and no heel. At, the first, at first, the people didn't believe in me. How could they when I didn't believe in myself? When it was over, my husband called me a superhero. Is it any wonder? I am woman. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is have friends that are doctors and nurses and tell them that you don't want to go to the hospital to have your baby. <sighs> oh, Lord. I mean, you could have, like, a flipper baby or... Yeah. 
Everything could go wrong. Okay. Jean, have you read the, the student's anthology? Some of it? Okay. Um, I think I'm obligated to mention that I just spent the summer wrapped up uh, working for young audiences, which is an awesome nonprofit that actually promotes arts education and artists working with students and everything good about the arts. <laughs> they kind of recognize that people need that stuff to grow. Um, but for six weeks, I got to work with 12, 11 apprentices, um, and, and Jean worked with me. Burp, burp, burp. There's a sh oh, wow. Okay, forget I said anything remotely serious. Thank you, Vertigo. You got anything else? Now that's it, that's the one you know? <laughs> wow. So, um, I wanted to read a few of their poems. And forgive me, guys, if you're actually coming in later. I know some of them will be here to read some more of their poetry later on tonight. Um, again, we are here till midnight. Really? Bunny ears? That's, that's all you got? <laughs> so we'll be here till midnight reading and broadcasting, streaming live, and you can check out our work and make donations at lakeeffectpoetry.com. And we'll just keep reading and keep performing until the sun goes down. And even longer. That's why we have coffee. That's why you do this at a coffee shop and not a bar. We'd all be passed out by five if we were at a bar. So, so um, the students that I worked with, they did a project called 100 Voices and they actually went out and interviewed people um, from different, different places, different organizations, but all of the people had something in common in the fact that they were experiencing some sort of crises, um, some sort of important moment in their life where they were going through a huge life change. Um, so they talked to people that were doing job search in this wonderful economy. They talked to people that were recovering from alcohol and drug abuse, from domestic violence, that were homeless. And they used those interviews to find a voice outside of themselves so that basically you could be a teenager and actually learn something about the world around you. And they did amazing work. So I wanted to share some of their poems with you. And you can, I believe, purchase their anthology 100 Voices through Young Audiences and also through Writing Nights Press. Thank you, Writing Nights Press, by the way. Uh, and this one is called Daddy's Shoes and it is by Kat Dysart. Trying to show him the right way, but he wants to be different. Wear daddy's shoes, but he can't fit them. My shoes weren't meant to be filled. His steps will be, will be bigger than mine. The shoes of an unemployed man don't fit a boy with promise. I'm doing right by them, by him. He was meant to go beyond his dad. Listening is not his strong suit, but I don't want him to learn the way I did. Kids make mistakes, but he won't make this one. I tell him, don't run the streets, run track. Come home late from a game or practice. He can't surpass me in jail, and he won't if he's dead. <laughs> Thank y'all. Again, I cannot believe, well, no, I'm not gonna say that. Cleveland is amazing in that teenagers here write amazing poetry. I continue to be stunned by their work. This one is entitled Gone by Emma Link. Mommy, she whines, eyes wide. Mommy, you aren't listening. And I murmur, yes, I am. And she babbles about someone's dog scribbling with red crayon and twirling a blonde lock of hair. And with a jolt, I realize that I'm not. Off in space trying to get away from this angel, I'm not listening. Her macaroni turns out soggy, overcooked. No, 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 I used to make it so well. 
back when she wasn't hanging on my legs, mine constantly, back when I could think clearly and the bottles didn't pile up. The next day, I'm shaking. I want it, I want her, I want it. Everything just keeps slipping, car, job, education. And finally, I knock on the gates, just breathing. Woot, woot. And this one is called At the Interview by Mr. Aiden Kasky. I'd like to say online, Mr. Aiden, you are one of the best dressed teenagers I've ever met. You gotta love a 15 year old that will wear a tie every day. Every day. God, I'm bored. I came here to get a job, but now I just sit and wait. I wait to be told by some high school dropout if I'm qualified enough to flip a burger, to restock a shelf, but I grit my teeth. Because it's not just me, I have a daughter, I have a son, and they don't understand that when mommy's smoking to not talk to her, that when she's acting strange, it's just better to leave her alone. But they don't. And I can't tell them I can stop at any time. I can, I can, but I know how I sound. I've heard it before. I can stop any time, but I don't. So I grit my teeth into a smile and I dress nice and I hope that I'm qualified for life. Okay. Um, and this one is called Steering, which actually got read on Around Noon with Dee Perry. Our, uh, one of our apprentices got to hang out with the most awesome woman in Cleveland, I think. <laughs> so uh, this is by Aaron McClarty, entitled Staring. It's foolish, me speeding down this exit ramp like I'm 17 years old, riding without parents or peers for the first time, but I am not young. I'm not even by myself. I'm the parent driving down the road with my pregnant daughter. I'm putting their lives at risk as I fall asleep at the wheel, unaware of what's at stake, unaware that the freeway, it's just a bad metaphor for the crack cocaine I've smoked, and me falling asleep is just me having a relapse. No, this is not just a comparison. This really happens. My daughter takes the wheel as my foot stays on the pedal, but she's not the one who can steer me in the right direction. I must wake up before I fly off the next bridge. If I can just wake up, I might win over this addiction. Okay. And one more from my wonderful poetry babies. This one is entitled Failure by one Mr. Dejan Plummer, who also looks pretty smart in a tie. He sits in a dark, confined place and meditates on his failure. He stops because his head is throbbing uncontrollably. His eyes are burning from holding back his tears. The floodgates break. Water rushes down his face. He violently shakes. Abundant are his screams. He's failing again at maintaining his composure because the steel walls of his of these steel walls of his are actually sentimental emotions in disguise that are crumbling. He is struggling to get to his feet. He walks to the mirror on the wall, wipes his tears, and sniffs the rest of his crybaby feelings back into firm formation like nothing ever happened. He puts his white makeup on his face along with the red nose. He makes his bitter mouth look hilarious by adding a, right, a bright red lipstick smile. He's always smiling even when he's obviously crying out for help and needing attention. Now fully dressed in his clown suit, ready to put on an act, to, pre to pretend to be a happy man again. Yay for my teen poets. Woot. Woot. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all I got, woot.
Are we still in mellow poetry time, or? <laughs> huh? Get rowdy? Her. I could do angry poetry. Jean, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for visiting. <laughs> Aw. I love you. Yes, I brought the baby's bottle so the car didn't stink like milk. That's husband number two. <laughs> hey, you know, it's all right. You're not husband number three. Really? <laughs> so not right. So not right. Okay. So, uh, I am still on my other people's poetry. I know I'm okay with that. I don't even know where I find certain things, but I have a book called Hearts Cargo. And it is the poetry of Cleveland, written, well, I should say published in 1985. Yes. So it's kind of like this awesome flashback, you know? Kind of see what people were thinking about this area, uh, you know, a couple decades ago, and you realize a whole lot ain't changed. I think that that's what's horrible and absolutely wonderful about Cleveland. <laughs> so, read a few pieces here. Um, and one, I'll start with the uh, title piece, The Heart's Cargo, by Daniel Thompson, kind of like the godfather of the Cleveland poetry scene. Not with us anymore. Awake at last past liberties, long snake of warning, winged apocalypse, gulls scatter and wind, our sulking wounds traffic. Toward the downtown spread, sky rocks the, sc sky rocks the eye. Does each white horse cry, help me, I'm dying. Light and the lungs shake loose, vessels, feather and scale, pitch to the elements. What crane can wrestle with the heart's cargo? Above the Black Wreath Stadium, a cloud of sorrow. The Indian sign, no home runs cheer, we <laughs> no home runs cheer Chief Wahoo. Only memories running home grief. The face cracked open on the bridge. The tears flowing over the Cuyahoga. Come home, Daniel, your mother's dead. I fell in with the dreaming crowd. We worked the games, a winning season, a hot dog lady, an orangeade kid, with no place like first place, no place like home. Still our harbor for dark desire. Now it's victim's weight from my shoulder against the stone. Up the hill, trudge to the halls of justice. And in the distance, gulls circle like buzzards over death. This one I found interesting because I actually just finished as I mentioned, working um, for, actually for Artworks, which is a program of young audiences, and we were stationed down at the Halley Building. Hi, Rat! We were stationed down at um, the Halley Building in Public Square, so this one is entitled Public Square. You know, circa 1985. <laughs> Just dig that stuff, okay. With camera, film, and lenses, I sit and wait for city life with Tom L. And his well-bundled friends, Woolens and July? Never mind, they are old and streetwise and keep the faith long after it's abandoned by those who can. No, 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 I'm not Pigeon Mary, she yells amid a flurry of feathers and a cloud of breadcrumbs scooped from ancient creased shopping bags. The day-old wonders sail from her knowing fingers to impatient breaks. Three bags full and still they flock. 
No Pinja Mary. She's the famous one, the one in the newspapers, the one whose houses they're trying to steal. Me? I'm Pigeon Annie. But you know something? I don't even like pigeons. They're so fat and greedy. Look over there. Those poor sparrows can hardly get something to eat. Behind me shuffles Fast Eddie. His odor precedes his arrival. Fast Eddie, agent to the birds and bums, puzzled by my interest in pea-stained winos and unkempt birds. Hey, you from welfare? Police? FBI? Hey, you old enough to remember streetcars? I'm the agent for these pigeons. It'll cost you $500 for the rights to photograph them. Hey, do you believe in prenatal influence? Hell, I don't. When my mother was pregnant with me, once she got mad and went around the house breaking all the phonograph records, and it didn't affect me, didn't affect me, didn't affect me, didn't affect me. He snickers and shuffles. He must hurry. The mission closes at 8. <laughs> See, our poetry heritage is strong. Yay. <laughs> strong like bull. Okay. How to be like the industrial north. Decorate yourself with the abandon of the city. A newspaper crumpled under each arm, creased with sweat. Fill your, fill your pockets with partial cigarettes and half-thought cigars. Keep the pigeon stable on the crown of your head. Make your eyes red with the haze of fear and cushion your feet with a mixture of small stones, fine dust, and splinters of glass. Cover the ankles with labels of cheap chemical wines that think grapes are legends. Apply for federal aid. Keep a knife handy to protect the wages of misfortune and wear a sign advertising the site of a famous battle or ghetto or default. Watch yourself return to dust. Um, and this poem is by John Bassett, somebody else who is no longer with us, but quite a legend as far as uh, folk singing goes here in Cleveland and elsewhere. Um, one of my personal favorites uh, song-wise is Weed and Wine. Yeah, Weed and Wine, to mellow out your mind. <laughs> because they knew how to write songs in the 70s. Anyways, Euclid Heights Boulevard flows. Euclid Heights Boulevard flows from humble beginnings. She meanders at her leisure, languid and listless, past late model cars, dogs with people on leashes, and discreetly hidden speed traps. Euclid Heights Boulevard flows beyond apartment houses filled with the upwardly mobile, beyond bona fide mansions hidden with within tiny forests separated from the world by moats infested with alligators. Euclid, Hyde Boule Euclid Heights Boulevard flows, mingling with her tributaries, fair amount above, cedar below, like whitewater rapids, headlong into Carnegie at rush hour. Sharks, barracuda, and piranha, descending to seek their level in the valley below. Onward to commerce and business, into the land of giant shoeboxes standing on end. Euclid Heights Boulevard flows across the bridge into the west town shore. Euclid Heights Boulevard flows again at evening tide, reverses her flow, brings the fish home bare to the bones, empties them into the foothills of Coventry and Shaker and beyond. Again, circa 1985, and some shit just don't change. I love it. And this one is the last one I'm going to read from this, but mm, I don't know if this is more about just objects and love and love and objects with a little hint of Cleveland. And it's entitled Ode to a Bed. The man and woman who stretched upon this frame and dreamt and woke and loved in it before us are a long time dead. Their journey was tremendous. They had come from far away, perhaps from Poland or Budapest. You'll have full lives and beget many children in this bed. The old, yellow, the old fellow stank of basement juice, plum wine stained the yellow teeth, and with his gypsy wish, he passed his hands over us. Outside in autumnal rain, you could smell the delicious steam tumbling out from the hot dog inn on 41st in the rain. 
puddles. The gutters were matted with a mush of piebald and orange leaves. The approach of darkness quenched our bargain. The walnut wood of our bed is curved at the foot like a boat's bow. Bow. The headboard swirls in a chipped fleur-de-lis, the slats hand-sawed from fence posts, four tiny wheels on the bottom of four legs. We sail here, we storm. Once in Ohio in a tornado watch, without fear, here we made love. There is no danger, no lightning bolt to blind us, no room that is not our own. Once we fall upon this wooden barge of dreams, floating, wandering. It's by Tim Joyce. <laughs> okay, so my husband has gone from a strawberry shortcake uh, apron to large purple gloves that look a bit intimidating, or? I don't know, like, like Pulp Fiction type cl uh, killer or something? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Huh? Um, the fourth member of our team, Skylark Bruce, has arrived. Yay! You can totally have a couple minutes. Okay. All right. Um, I have one more piece that I'm going to do. And, and Teresa, can you really quick shout out what the name of this is? Because you're so good at it. The Sunday Fun Day Fun, what is it? <laughs> the Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. The Sunday Fun Day Fun Drive. Say it three times fast, everyone. You too can help send us to nationals. All right. We got five. All right. I'm going to see if I can get my song on for a second here. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll do that in a little little while. I'm coming back this evening. <laughs> After a nap time and poop, I'll be back. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that, that risque stuff for the evening. Um, but, oh, yeah, yeah. Anybody else love Ani DeFranco? Okay, well, there's two. That's good. Uh, hmm? Never heard of her? Oh, you're so young. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. So I'll sing a little song and then read a little poem because they kind of go hand in hand because the song was, well, the song was the inspiration to write a poem about the experience of my first marriage and husband number one. Hi, husband number two, I love you. Okay. <laughs> number two is always better, there we go. More satisfying. That's true, I probably shouldn't talk about that on streaming video though, yeah. <laughs> I am walking out in the rain and I am listening to the loud moan. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, let me start over. <laughs> this is what happens when you have too much coffee before you get started. Um, okay. I am walking out in the rain and I am listening to the loud moan of the dial tone again and I am getting nowhere with you. And I can't let it go, and I can't get through. Both hands, please.
please use both hands. Oh, no, don't close your eyes. I am writing graffiti on your body. I am drawing the story of how hard we try. How hard we try. And I'm watching your chest rise and fall like the tides of my life. And the rest of it all Cause your bones have been my bed frame And your flesh has been my pillow I've been waiting for sleep To offer up the deep with both hands Oh, with both hands And in each other's shadows We grew less and less tall And eventually our theories couldn't explain it all And I'm recording our history now on the bedroom wall and when we leave the landlord will come and paint over it all and i'm walking out in the rain and i am listening to the loud moan of the dial tone again and i am getting nowhere with you and i can't let it go and i can't get through both hands Please use both hands. Oh, no, don't close your eyes. I am writing graffiti on your body. I am drawing a story of how hard we try. How hard we try. How hard we try. And this is called yellow. Yellow is the color I feel when I think of you. It is the main hue in a photo that I did not, could not throw away. Even when I was angry, even when it was easiest to blame all on you, while the poor lighting makes the picture seem from a distant time, everything about you, the wild hair, flashing smile, surprised look as you walk away from the camera keeps you framed forever young on top of my bookcase. How often have I sat to write to you? Remember, I was famous for writing things that should have been covered with honest conversation, but I sit again, pull out the paper, and the note produced is not to you. Instead, it is always a letter to my young husband, the man in a yellowing picture who played guitars in my heart, fingers nervously splayed over both sets of strings, the one who wrote letters and pure poetry just for me, with a passion apparently born from the muse you hoped I could be. My letter is always to that young man, the one I cannot forget. I want to cry my sorries into his hair, pity pressed against his ear. Forgive me for not knowing how to love you, lover. And forgive me, and forgive me, as I have forgiven you, whispering until my prayer is heard a decade into the past, understanding a girl's apologies for infidelities, for promises broken, for youth and thank yous for loving me purely once. In innocence once, we not understanding how young we really were, we not knowing all the ways to wound a soul until you can't love it back to you again. How in ignorance kind hearts can be so cruel to each other. I write this letter to you, my young husband, over and over again, crying over the page, over the years, over the girl I lost, along with you crying, tears collecting over words, sentences drowned into fragments running incomplete, down the page, together, much like we did once, running, incomplete, together. Someone had to know it was wrong. Someone needed the strength to say it was over. So angry that you were the someone first, and grateful because you were right. Thank you. Hot diggity damn, is that a Bobby Frost in the house? Hi, sir. Okay, I feel good because I didn't read from my Frost anthology yet, just in case. You getting on the mic, Mr. Man, later on? I think you should. I think you should. Especially before I have to leave for nap time and poop. <laughs> I'm a mommy, it sucks. I mean, I love it. I love my baby. 
and nap time and poop. All right. But <laughs> I am going to turn over the mic to the wonderful, talented Miss Scott. Oh, beautiful. I, I, mysterious. What else we got? Dangerous. Ah, volatile. Um, I don't know. What else? Combustible, busty, whatever. Uh, Miss Skylark, Bruce. Thank you. I don't suppose that I am any more combustible or flammable than anybody else here. I do know that things on me break, so um, I want to give props to the gentleman over here who, like me, is wearing a knee brace. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> My first piece tonight, or today, this afternoon, whatever time of the day it is, is kind of about that. It's called The Swap. 29-year-olds aren't supposed to need knee surgery. At least that's what my orthopedist said. I'm not supposed to have arthritis or complex tears in my medial meniscus, least of all a piece of that muscle flipped up and under my kneecap. This isn't supposed to happen for a few more decades at least, but I'll take it. I'll do a swap. If I take all the sickness, injury, and pain of my senior citizen days upon me now, then I will experience the carefree, boundless energy of youth when I am in my 70s and 80s. I will be the first 90-year-old on the U.S. Olympic volleyball team. I'll rarely get so much as a sniffle while others exhaust their Medicaid funds. Bring it on. Rather than dreading my aging years, I anticipate them because I will be on the upswing. I will pay the price at 29, 30, 31. I might be made of spare parts by 40, but they will gleam. I've got the insurance coverage in the present, may as well use it. Women usually reach their sexual peak around 45. Oh, I'll have a peak then, but come 65, it's all uphill from there. The cougars of tomorrow will worship a new goddess. Move over, Aphrodite. I'll blow past all the age-related world records, swimming the English Channel, topping Mount Everest, longest, lo longest non-stop Lindy Hop. Mine, mine, all mine. Usually, young looks are prized among belly dancers, but I will not only have the skills, I will have the looks at 85 to make even the straightest woman and gayest man drool at my shimmies and snake arms. Is that my phone going off? Okay. I cower in pain now, wincing with each shaky step down the stairs. My mind draws pictograms of my right knee buckling as it has a terrifying frequency, and my left warns it may not always do the work of two. Eh, yank him out. Hip replacements, hearing aids, and pacemakers don't phase me. The original model came without a lifetime guarantee, so I'll swap it for parts with longer mileage. I will be a spry elderly person with strength and balance as my hallmarks. My chapbooks and full-length poetry collections published well into my 90s will easily title me not just the most prolific lifelong poet, but also best poet of any age, and she's 100. I dare say, I will quite enjoy this swap. Thank you. Um, last night, I was the winner of the Writing Nights Grand Champion, or Grand Tournament, because there were no other slam poets there <laughs> who were performing, I think. Um, so it would have been nice to have some more competition. Next year, I want to see a lot more of people like of us there performing, competing, participating. So I'm going to read a few pieces from the, uh, what I did last night. This one is a tribute to the people who helped me get started in poetry and put up with me as a brand new poet last year. Your poetry baby began with an orgasm. Mmm. Oh. Oh. You were that excited to invite a newbie to your poetry workshop. Eep! 
It was just after Valentine's Day, which makes it more miraculous because the zygote was sure that poetry belonged solely to lovebirds and naturists. You didn't know for sure you were pregnant until you saw the blue lines, black lines, gel pen lines your poetry baby had scratched out in prenatal rhyme. The first trimester kept you vomiting. Your poetry baby had no innate sense of imagery and your senses were heightened to every bland phrase. If this is what gestating a poet is like, hold the enchilada sauce because it's coming back up. How many times did you wish for a scalpel to sever the embryo from your overburdened uterus? Listening to yet another half-baked half-pint, pouring prose onto pages, chopping it into sentence fragments, and calling it poetry. It must have sent your finely tuned ears into cravings so intense that pickles and cheese was qualify as dessert. But your poetry baby developed a heart and a backbone. You could see some form taking shape. But your poetry baby developed... Yeah, you were pregnant with a poet, glowing. Others commented on your expanding belly, going to be a big one. Did she kick your ribs much? She kicked, fought, gulped in mouthfuls of amniotic fluid when you said over and over, show, don't tell. Your ribs thought they might never lose their black and blue hue. She kept you up all night, workshopping her latest creation. You swore, this baby is nocturnal. She's most active at 2 a.m. One September day, you finally birthed your poetry baby. You gathered your friends and family round to hear the latest drafts of Luis y su madre. You kissed the baby's forehead and pronounced her, at long last, a poet. It didn't take quite nine months, but you were ready to push her out into the wide open world. By Christmas time, your poetry baby was crawling. That's my girl, you exclaimed when she called to tell you that she'd beaten a long-standing favorite poet in a poetry joust. You changed a lot of poopy slam pieces. You woke up what seemed like all night to the sound of her crying over the latest literary mess, but she was moving in the right direction. Then, at your urging, she made alternate to the local slam team. Her performance at a regional slam brought tears to your eyes, knowing how far she has come in a year. You could not have been prouder. You beamed, fussed, and adored because your poetry baby is walking now. Okay, no problem. Okay, while he's doing that, I will, did we already mention